This is our review of Social Game Blood on the Clock Tower. The best game of deduction and deception that we've played in years, and the most monstrous thing to come out of Australia since Vegemite. Although this is not a finished copy of the game. This is just a handmade prototype. But the game is on Kickstarter right now, where it's gonna be vigorously scribbed clean of the fonts Times New Roman and Papyrus. You can find a link to that campaign in this video's description, and you might want to check it out because I think this might be my favorite board game. Full stop? I think maybe, yeah. What? I think it might be my favorite game too. Yes! <laughs> okay, okay, let's get started. We've got a laughably large box here, but the bones of this game are simply werewolf, otherwise known as mafia. Players are all given a secret role at the beginning of the game telling you if you're either on a team of innocent townsfolk or a smaller team conspiring with a demon. And while the townsfolk have no idea who anyone is, the evil team know exactly where one another are. To win, the townsfolk need to use gut feeling and cool calculation to guess at who the demon might be, call a vote, and if more than half of the living players agree, the group then executes that player. But you can't make a justice omelette without breaking a few innocent eggs. Townsfolk can expect to accidentally kill members of their own team. And that's fine, so long as they eventually call the vote that kills the demon. But the pressure's on. Between each round of discussion and execution, players go to sleep by closing their eyes and you enter a night phase, where a moderator known as the storyteller helps players to wake up one by one and use their special powers. And the demon's special power is to kill yet another player. Everyone then wakes up, and the storyteller announces who the demon killed that night. And if the evil team can whittle the group down to just two living players, one of whom is the demon, the evil team wins. This folk game was first invented in the Soviet Union in 1986, and now Quinns is going to show you how Blood on the Clock Tower takes this classic format completely off the rails. Choo-choo, baby. Choo-choo. Let's start with the smallest change from Werewolf, which is that when you are inevitably killed by a vote or a demon or an accident or any of the thousand other deaths that await in that gothic chocolate box, you're not eliminated and you don't have to sit there in silence. If you die, you play on as a perfectly chatty ghost, but you can only vote to execute somebody once for the rest of the game. And this always leads to an awesome final round where all of the ghosts' votes are spent hungrily, angrily, incorrectly, and the living players end up appealing to this spectral jury. The bigger problem with being killed in this game is you lose your character's power. Ah. Blood on the Clock Tower first begins with your group choosing a set of roles. And because I'm as pompous as a human tuber, I like to think of these as different villages where you might visit. You might travel to an ordinary town of God-fearing laborers, a frontier society where players routinely kill each other by accident, or a settlement of artists and philosophers where reality itself threatens to escape your grasp. Basically, each of these is a set of roles that works well together. Once you've picked where you're going to, you hand each player a reference sheet and, well, I suppose it's good that a horror game includes something genuinely horrifying. Blood on the Clock Tower starts with every single player receiving a secret role with their own secret power. The empath is told each night how many of their living neighbors are evil. The soldier survives the night if the demon chooses to try and kill them. The saint is a player on the good team, but if they are executed by a democratic vote, evil wins instantly as the town comes to terms with the fact that they are the real monsters. Yeah, I didn't say all of the powers were good for your team. During the game, players can of course say what roles they are, but be careful. You never know if anyone's telling the truth, but also everything you share is helping the demon to identify the most helpful townsfolk and slaughter them first. And here's the kicker. Whether you're good or evil, nobody knows which of these 22 roles are in your game. Although the demon is shown three roles which weren't handed out that they can then pretend to be perhaps claiming to be the washerwoman and providing fake information, or even the saint, the role you can't kill or evil wins. 
And so the demon vanishes into the game's puzzle like a rat slipping behind a skirting board. Out of the gate, this makes Blood on the Clock Tower strikingly complex in a way that's going to intimidate just about everybody. My first game of this made me feel not just out of my depth, but like I was treading water above a deep sea trench with horrible monsters beneath me. It's not just that players around the circle want you dead, it's that in being given a private responsibility, it immediately makes the game so much more electric than Werewolf. Everybody wants to speak, and no one knows if they should. Players can whisper to each other or even have actual sidebars, so long as they're willing to risk the group deciding that they're up to no good and forcing those players to explain themselves. So all of this is very intense. You've got all of these possibilities thrown at you and a very real fear of messing things up. But within 20 minutes, after everyone's initial nerves and reservations have settled, this puzzle comes alive with feelings. Whilst at the beginning you're filled with distrust and suspicion, you quickly realise that the game isn't about feeding those fears, it's about finding trust. In games like Werewolf or The Resistance, where you're given less information, there's a tendency to adopt a herd mentality as the group fixates on tiny details. Blood on the Clock Tower frees you from those chains and brings out the iconoclast in everybody. Everyone's opinion and thoughts in this game are valid. In fact, in order to win the game against evil, everyone has to come together in a very real way to reach a decision. It's a game that shows how building bonds and forming relationships are a vital part of survival. And within your town, your role isn't just a power you're given, it's an identity. You're not just on the blue or red team in this game. You're a washerwoman who gets rudely awoken on the first night to learn the secret identity of two other village folk. You're a monk who has taken a solemn vow to protect the village from the demon within its mist. Or you're an empath with a paranormal ability to perceive evil if it's sitting next to you. And of course, this means everyone gets their moment in this game. You're never a bystander. You're a protagonist holding a single piece of a jigsaw that's been shredded by the storyteller. You feel incredibly real, and the game is you convincing your friends that you're the genuine article. But more than this, Blood on the Clock Tower is an instant community in a box. Imagine you're the grandmother, and you learn on the first night that you have a grandchild. Normally, you can't really trust anyone in the room when you first open your eyes, but you're different. Having this one person that you know is good from the start creates this affinity and affection to a single person that no other game comes close to. You'd step in front of a knife for your grandchild, but in actual fact, this is just some guy you met 20 minutes ago and you can't even remember his actual name. All of which gives Blood on the Clock Tower an unexpected feel-good side. When most deception games leave you feeling like your friendships have been tested, Blood on the Clock Tower starts with distrust, but it sees players learning more, sharing more information, and becoming closer together. It starts to feel like a village worth saving. And as for being on the evil team, it's like nothing we've ever played. In other social deduction games, it's enough to be forgettable, to fade into the background like the murderer in a whodunit. That won't work here. The good team are too valiant, too powerful, too... Ugh, good! Instead, you're going to need to get involved. For starters, you're going to need to take the plunge and lie about what role you are, always taking the gamble that someone else sat around you is not that role. Then you need to start planting and pruning disinformation. And this is unbelievably delicate. If you lie too wildly, you'll reveal yourself as an aberration. If you twist the screw of deceit too gingerly, players will efficiently classify you like a butterfly in a killing jar. Vitally, Blood on the Clock Tower has none of the aggressive accusation, you're lying, and angry rebuttals. The only reason you'd say that is if you're evil, everyone kill him! That defines Werewolf and led to me stopping playing The Resistance because it's exhausting and frustrating. Instead, Blood on the Clock Tower has an important release valve that means hardly any rage builds up, which is that everything is unknowable. The game is drenched in mystery. If you ask a player, what role are you? And they say, I don't know, I, I don't wanna say. That could actually be legit. They might not know. They might not want to say. Even if your role means you get information that that player is definitely the demon, you can never be sure. 
because there are ways you could have been poisoned, which means you are receiving false information right now. Honestly, the many and varied ways in which you can't trust what you know in this game make it a better showcase of, of paranoia and madness than any Lovecraft board game I've played. I mean, the Bad Moon Rising set has a role called the Lunatic. The Lunatic, at the start of the game, draws a demon token out of the bag and spends the whole game thinking they're a demon, it's just the people they choose for death might not actually die, and it's up to the lunatic to figure out that they're impotent and actually on the good team. And because it's impossible to know anything for sure, the game here stretches out deliciously. In all too many deduction games, they transition way too fast from unsolvable to solved. Not so here. From minute one, you are wrestling with this enormous mystery, and that lasts the entire game, almost two hours sometimes, as if the designers of Blood on the Clock Tower were expert confectioners, stretching out the best moment in a deduction game as if it was so much sugar, folding it into delicious patterns. It's epic. There's no other word for it. You can go from trusting your neighbour to not trusting them because they're evil, to knowing that they are evil, to then trusting only them. Uh, until the last throws of the game when you have this sinking feeling that actually they are evil only to find out that they're not and you have to apologize. Uh, listen, um, about last night? Oh, oh yeah? I just want to say uh, sorry. Oh, oh, you're sorry? You're sorry for, for believing I was lying? and then announcing to everyone I was lying, and then deciding I wasn't lying, but then, no, 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 Quinz is definitely lying, and actually we need to get him kills. Yeah? It's totally okay. It was the best game. <laughs> it was so good. It's a journey you go on together. There's so much game here, but it's not tiring. Our group would play a 90 minute game only to agree to take a five minute break just so we could leap straight back into another game. And then past midnight when we were finally done, we would just immediately make plans to meet again the very next week. For months. And I think part of that is because the joy you get from a game of Blood on the Clock Tower doesn't end when the game ends. We spent so much time in the hours afterwards analysing how people interacted that the fun I get from an hour of playing Blood on the Clock Tower exceeds any other game in my collection. New players would join our group and we'd tell them stories of past games like grandparents telling their grandchildren about a bygone era. And then that night's game would start and we'd write a new chapter together. It's a game so many of our friends developed a fervent need to play again and again. And like all demonic cults, you don't know what you're missing until you take part. So that is our review of Blood on the Clock Tower. I've never, I've never done that before, that was really scary. Uh, but that's only our review for the players. We wouldn't be done tonight until we told you what Blood on the Clock Tower was like for the storyteller. Anyone who's ever tried to moderate a game of werewolf and discovered how hard it is to remember about three different roles will probably right now be slack-jawed at the thought of trying to run a game that involves 10, 12, 14 different player powers. But, come take a look at this. Hang on, hang on, uh, hang on, hang on. Ugh. So, Blood on the Clock Tower's box using a couple of bulldog clips actually transforms into a felt-lined, a, a felt-lined toolbox for the moderator. Everything sticks to the inside, and then by making use of an ingenious system of chips and clips and a laughably involved night sheet telling you who to wake up in what order, that's not a night sheet. Oh god, I'm really quite hungover. Uh, that reminds you to put on yet more reminder tokens. Running this game isn't just easy, it is empowering. You are stalking around with this giant book and all of the answers like Hell's Maitre D. Not only running the game effortlessly and adding to the ambiance with this bizarre prop, but making notes on which players are bluffing as what. You see, this isn't like Werewolf. You're not just passing the game like a computer in a cloak. 
Blood on the Clock Tower sees you playing with your friends. And I mean that in the same sense that you might play with your food. You see, within Blood on the Clock Tower's roles are all sorts of troublesome fuzziness. So if you're the pacifist, your power is that executed good players might not die. If you're the poisoner, then you have the ability to poison a different player each night, temporarily causing their power to misfire. Information they would receive is instead misinformation, but what misinformation do you give your players? In all of these cases, and very many more, it's simply up to you, the storyteller. The manual arms you with one bit of advice, which is try and help the losing side, and this makes the game sing. Of course it does. Think about the most memorable individual matches of board games you've played. They probably had poetic stuff like the game going down to the very last second or a player that was bullied or quiet or new turning out to be a, a tour de force in the final rounds of the game. Well, in Blood of the Clock Tower, you have a player, the storyteller, working almost invisibly to engineer those Disneyland moments. Sometimes that's as simple as ensuring a new player doesn't get unlucky for two games in a row. Or sometimes it's as devious as looking at what the demon is saying, and whenever you give misinformation out, you ensure that it corroborates all of their lies. In fact, if you're an experienced storyteller, the manual even suggests that you break the rules as you see fit. Wake a player in the night and give them information they shouldn't have, or an ultimatum they weren't expecting, or threaten them if they're just being a dick and ruining the game. Oh, during my favorite moments as a Blood on the Clock Tower moderator, I feel like an author sat at their messy desk having started a story, but then lost control of their characters, and it's all you can do with blood and sweat just to get this thing to a satisfying ending. And also, the game you're playing as the moderator? There is depth here. As you swap to more complicated playsets, you have to go from simply providing misinformation to becoming an actual character. Some roles in the more advanced sets involve people going to you privately and being told like what is true and what is false, like you're something out of Greek myth. I have run a lot of Two Rooms and a Boom, and I love running Two Rooms and a Boom, but after a while I sort of felt like uh, I'd, I'd mast well, not mastered it, but I was used to it, you know, and I didn't know where to go from there. With Blood on the Clock Tower, I want to moderate this so much, I want to become great. It reminds me of the feeling when I DM Dungeons and Dragons, and it's a skill that I just want to develop and develop and develop. But let me not overstate this. The thrill of being the moderator is, in this game is sometimes just really simple. Sometimes it's as fun as walking around and waking up your friends in the night, giving all the good boys and girls a little sprinkle of adrenaline. I'm gonna repeat a line that we said in our Treasure Island review, which is, if your board game collection is full of one-of-a-kind experiences, you have to buy this. There is nothing like being the storyteller in Blood on the Clock Tower. And if you're a collector of rare experiences, it is worth the asking price just for that alone. Or, you know, I can put it even simpler. Moderating Blood on the Clock Tower is the most thought-provoking fun this hobby has given me in years. The fact that when my friends come over, I get to moderate one game of Blood on the Clock Tower and then swap someone else in so I get to play in the next one makes me feel spoiled. But before you run off and order yourself a copy of this game, we've got just a couple of practicalities to make you aware of. One big one is that this is a big group game, so you need a big, big group. group to play it. You can play a quick facsimile of the game with about five players and a storyteller, and there's even rules to play an absurd version with 20 players, but the sweet spot's about 8 to 13 players. So if you can't assemble a group of that size, then this isn't the game for you. No. We should also talk a bit about price, which, like this box, we think has been blown out of all proportion. The price on the Kickstarter is $79 plus shipping. And that certainly sounded high to me before I played this game and seen everything that was in the box. And now I feel that $79 is, if anything, cheap 
This is an enormous box. It is heavy. You're paying for felt backing for the box and tokens, which is absolutely needed to play the game. You're getting more than 60 laminate sheets. You're getting indescribable bittiness. Clips, bags, boxes within boxes, reminder tokens to remind you to put down more reminder tokens. Of course, it's more expensive than other social deduction games. There's never been a social deduction game like this. There may never be again. There are 99 different rolls in here, and it doesn't just come from these three different play sets. You also have some powerful traveler rolls, specifically for if players need to leave early or show up late, or fabled rules and rolls that are essentially a toolbox for an experienced storyteller, perhaps throwing everyone's strategies into disarray with the placing of a single extra rule. Or just making it easier for players with disabilities. For example, if it's harder for them to hear when everyone's talking. Which is just amazing. Never has a team worked so generously to make a complicated game so accessible. One of the roles a storyteller can add is just a little modifier that reads, if you talk over new players, you may die in the night. Which Matt liked so much, he had done up in some calligraphy. Believe it or not, this is the Gloomhaven of social games, by which I mean, yes, it's very expensive, and yes, it's kind of ugly, and yes, there is an argument to be made that it is perhaps too big. But if you care about this hobby, you're not going to be making that argument, because this is everything that board games can be. It is ridiculous, and it is masterfully crafted, and it is spellbinding. Uh. Thank you very much for watching this episode of uh, Shut Up and Sit Down. Special thanks this episode goes to everybody who helped us to playtest Blood of the Clock Tower. Uh, th well, um, almost everybody who helped us to playtest. Uh, I don't want to thank uh, the liars. These people came into my house, looked me in the eye, and lied. So, uh, they, you three, Shafi, Annie, Rob, you've disgraced yourself. Um, and now the internet knows it. And uh, Shut Up and Sit Down has other videos you can watch. Love it if you click subscribe. Big into subscribers. <clears throat> this, uh, sorry, uh, this studio light here has, has activated my hangover. So that's good. Um,